to get started, I will be coming from 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we know that Pastor has been doing a series called Down Goes Goliath. And when Pastor asked me to prepare a word, this is where God took me. And I know Pastor was continuing his series, and I wanted to deviate from this. But I didn't get a release from God, so I stayed in the lane. Amen? So we're going to start at chapter 2, and I'm going to read 3, then I'm going to jump to 8, 9, and 10, then I'm going to jump down to 23 and 29. And the word reads, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together. I got a little vibration. Can you help me out there, please? And they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The word array means position. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. I mean, I always know there's always something between you. Verse 8, then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out to the lineup for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Am I not your problem? Am I not what's standing in your way? Am I not what's going to keep you from getting to the other side? And you, the servants of Saul, chose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. Choose a man for yourselves. Verse 9, if he is able to fight with me and kill me. So some things that we got to do, not only do we have to fight, we're going to have to kill it. Because the fight is not going to be enough. Then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. So no matter what you're facing or dealing with or going through, whatever is standing in your way, if you don't kill it, then you're serving it. If you don't kill it, then you're a slave to it. Now, you got to make up in your mind. You got to make the decision and the choice with the stars right here. And the Philistines say, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Don't you know whatever you're dealing with and going through is calling you out? It is daring you to fight it. It is daring you to overcome it. It is daring you to survive it. It is daring you. Everything that everybody's going in here with. So today, I want you to touch your heart, touch yourself, search your soul, and say, say la, because there is something that we all are facing that is challenging us, that is in the way, that does not want us to touch that place that God has prepared for you and I. Verse 23. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words, so David heard them. Uh-oh, somebody listening. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. God rewards those who follows the plan. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, that one that was watching saying, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? See, he wasn't really worried about the reward of what he was going to get. He seen that this man was out of line. This man was out of order. And he was handling God's people in a way that was not pleasing in his eyes. And for who is this uncircumcised Philistine? that he should defy the armies of the living God. And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Verse 29, last verse. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? 
And the title of this sermon today, even though David asked the question, is there not a cause? I say that there is a cause. So we, we will get started here. There is a cause. That's the title of the sermon. There is a cause. Well, Pastor was up here preaching last Wednesday. He was all up in this sermon. I was like, man, I hope Pastor does going to. He got to a point he hit it last Sunday, but he didn't ride it. I thank the Lord for that. Because <laughs> if he'd have rolled it, I'd have had to go and change it up. I say to you today that there is a cause. God did not call David from the mountaintop. God did not call David from the peaks of life. God did not call David from riding a wave. No. What about the God that we serve? What if he called us to do our greatest work when everything was going right? What if he called us to do our greatest work and our greatest explorers when everything was just flowing our way? But God, the God that I serve, we all know he don't call us like that. God called David out of the wilderness. He called David from the backside of the mountain. He called David out of obedience. He called David and he chose David. Amen. He called David because of his heart. Heart check. God likes to get to the heart of the matter. God does not look external. He looks internal. Amen. It's a setup. God has set the stage for your coming out. I declare the decree, Matthew 20, 16. So the last shall be first and the first last. Many, many are called, but few are chosen. And the only way that you can be chosen is you have to choose God. You have to fully submit and you have to fully surrender. Amen. I know you may have been overlooked, not qualified, rejected, abandoned, uh, lost in your hope, lost in your trust, but it was all part of the plan. You probably have been last for so long that you forgot that you was last. You have been coming from behind so long that you forgot you was behind. Don't get comfortable in dysfunctionness. Sometimes we get comfortable in that place. Don't get comfortable when things are going bad. Don't get frustrated when they're going bad as well. Amen. None of us did not come to God by chance. It took something that drawed us to God. Nobody in here woke up all of a sudden in their own strength and decided it was time for me to go to the house of the Lord. It was time for me to begin to serve God. No, 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 no. It took circumstances, situations, letdowns, breakdowns, abandonment, pain, rejection, and all of that and other things else to bring us to God. It took something to get you and I here. There is a cause. There is a cause. I thank God for his chosen people. Now, after you have been accepted, if you have accepted the call, the real work begins. See, some of us think that once we accept the call, it's going to be all good. But this is when the real work begins. A lot of people think that we got to cush and we got it made for those of us who are believers and those of us who do serve God. Amen. But little do they know when they cross over to this side, it's a war. It's not like the other side. Because on that side, you get to do what you want to do. On this side, you got to do what you command to do. On the other side, you get to do it your way. But on this side, you got to walk in his ways. On the other side, you take the will. But on this side, Jesus take the will. He is taking you beyond the chosen. Have you ever thought about that? He is taking you beyond the faith. Many are called for your chosen. But what does it look like when you get beyond the chosen? Amen. We walk by faith and not by sight, but what does it look like when you begin to touch that thing that you was hoping for? When that thing that you hoped for was, is no longer intangible, it is now tangible. You can reach out and you can touch it. You're not no longer hoping for it. You're not longer desiring it. You're not no longer wanting it. Now it's in your hand, not even in the reach. You possess it. Amen? Before David went up against Goliath, David faced some adversity and obstacles or other things in the way. When you get a good word from the Lord, 
whether it's from this pulpit or from someone just pouring into your life, no matter where you are. Here comes the enemy. So you are responsible with the word that you receive. It's a great work to come with that word that you receive. You have to cultivate that word. You have to get in the dark with that word. You have to pray over that word. And you have to go in the spirit and ask God, is this word for me? Is this calling for me? This is, was this chosen for me? Amen. He was anointed as king. He was chosen by God. He was set apart by God. He was not man's choice, but God's choice. Amen. God did not look external. He looked at the heart. God did it then, and he's still doing it today. What's that? Looking at the heart. On paper, some of us, it may look good. Owning or buying your home, fat bank account, nice cars, high up on the job, always that go-to person, that looks good. Always a strong man, a strong woman. When people need advice and need help, you the person that they can turn to, that looks good. I said on paper, that looks good. But how does that look according to the plan? How does that look according to purpose? How does that look according to the promise? Amen. David was the eighth child. David was the last child. God was looking for a new king. The preceding king was already fired and didn't even know it. We know who the king was. It was Saul. God kept allowing him to work until there was someone to fulfill his shoes. So how many of you know that God will allow you to continue in your position and you are already fired? All he is waiting on for is your replacement. Amen? Have anybody been there? Have anybody seen that? Amen? God is ready to do a new thing in you. God is ready to start a new beginning in you. God has anointed you. As the king of kings, you are chosen by God. You all have been set apart by God, not by words or your works, but for a work in the Lord for a time such as this. Amen? Today, there is something that God wants us to understand. There is a cause. I'm going to hit you with that throughout. I want that to be embedded in your heart. I want it to be etched in your minds. There is a cause. There is a cause. I'm going to ask you to do something that we normally don't do, but I'm going to do it today because I'll lay it by the Spirit. Look at your neighbor to the left and tell them with all the exuberance that you can muster, there is a cause. Look at your neighbor to the right and get a little louder when you tell them, there is a cause. There is a cause. In Jeremiah 1, the headline reads, the call to Jeremiah. The headline reads that. And I'm going to bother you one more time. The headline reads, the call to Jeremiah. So I want you to say the call to whoever your name is, you feel in that place. And I want you to say that not once. I want you to say that not twice. But I want you to say it three times. It's something about the number of three. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I am which is, which was, and which is to come. Amen. Now, before, and after. Amen. This week, last week, next week. It's something about threes. God moves in threes. See, the three puts the final note on it. Are you ready? The call to Francetta. The call to Pastor Champ. The call to Mother Margaret. The call to Sister Janice. So when I tell you on the one, count of three, we're going to all speak that, not just to ourselves, but we're going to speak that into the atmosphere because we know God is a God who speaks things into existence. So you're about to speak your calling out into existence. You're about to speak your coming out into existence. So are we ready? One, two, three. The call to Tedrick. The call to Tedrick. The call to Tedrick. Now the atmosphere has been set for a breakthrough. The atmosphere has been set for a coming out. The atmosphere is set for a revival. The atmosphere has been set for you to come forth. The atmosphere has been set for your hope, your confidence to rise.
Jeremiah 1 and 5 declares, before you were formed, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you. I, God said, appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So before you were born, before you entered into this world, God established an outcome for your life. Isn't that amazing? When he anointed you, he called you, he chose you, he set you apart. This, this, this did not just happen. This happened before time. You were just now ready to bring out what would happen a predestined time now. Amen? The same talk that God had with Jeremiah, he's having with us today. God knew the process it was going to take that we were going to go through. God knew the foundation that needed to be laid in our lives. God knew the mistakes and the decisions that we were going to make. God knew every failure that was going to come in our path. Uh, and when you answer the call, it's going to cost you and I something. When you're chosen with the cost, it's going to cost you. And the cost is being ready. The cost is being ready to let go of the flesh, to die to the flesh. Are you ready to let go? The flesh is too alive. My flesh was alive, and it got in the way. Sometimes we're looking at the other person instead of taking a step back and looking at that man or that woman in the mirror. Amen? It's hard to look at self. It's hard to find fault in self. It's hard to find wrong in self. But self be our biggest enemy. We have to look within, not out. Are you ready to let go? Minister Lanny in class said today that change is a process. Transformation is a miracle. So do you need a miracle or do you just want to change? Do you need a miracle or do you just want to change? But we have to go through the process. Amen. The flesh must die. Not one time. Not every other week. Not every other day. Not this month. Skip two months in that month. Not last year. Skip a couple of years in this year. It must be done daily. When Jesus prayed, give me, give us this day our daily bread, the flesh has to die daily. Amen? What sustained you yesterday won't stain, sustain you today without God. What kept you yesterday won't keep you today without God. I start by to tell you that the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violence take it by force. Some things in your life that you lost, some things in your life that were taken away from you, you are not going to give them back. The enemy took them. How do you think he's just going to hand them back? You're going to have to fight for them. Whew. You and I have been equipped, even though the kingdom is at hand. How do we know we've been equipped? Jesus said in these words, it is finished. It is finished. And when he said that, he said it one time for all. The all is you and I. It is finished. There is a cause for the life, the death, the burial, and resurrection of our Lord. And this leads us to point number one. The kingdom is at hand. Today, I want you to look at your resume. Normally when we say resume, we think about the word work. But this is a different type of resume that I want you to look at. A resume that you've already been working on, a resume that you've already been building, but this is not a resume that you write. This is a resume that tells your life story. I'm talking about your life resume. So as you search yourself and do a self-inventory, a self-examination, I'm talking about a resume that is consisted of the body of work throughout your life. Let's take a look at David's resume versus Goliath. You got David on one hand. Right hand is very significant. We all know the right is the hand of blessing. We got Goliath over here. We got Israelite. We got Philistine. We got champion. We got uh, chosen. 
We got Champion. We got Ruddy. Ruddy is like a fresh face, fresh look, but he on the battlefield. And over here, we got a giant. We got armor of God is being worn here. Over here, we are wearing the battle armor. Over here, he's going to war with a slingshot and five stones. Over here, he is going to war with a sword and a, 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 a shield. Amen? Over here, we got servant. Over here, we got soldier. Amen? Over here, we got humble. Over here, we got arrogance. Over here, we got kingdom. And over here, we got world. Amen? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm rocking on this side right now, but I used to be over on this side. Humble. Ness in heart. Chosen by God. Wearing armor of God. Not chosen by man. Chosen by God. Kingdom over here. Champion of the people, Barabbas. Soldier for the people. Got his battle arm on. Arrogant, worldly. Look at your resume. The key about the resume is what do you see? Whatever you see, are you willing to transform it? What's in your resume? What are you willing to look at and not be in denial? Not willing to confront and say, this is an area of my life that needs to change. This is an area of my life that needs to be turned around. This is an area of my life that has gotten away, but I'm ready to regain a hold of it. This is an area of my life that was taken, that was dropped, but I'm ready to go and sit my life down at the king's table. This is an area of my life where I thought things were impossible, but I learned that I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. What area of your life? There is a cause that you see this. 1 Samuel 17, verses 2 and 3. I'm going to read them again. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and the Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley in between them. Now picture this here with your spiritual imagination. Walk with me. Philistine army on this side. They in battle array. They are in position. Israelite army on this side. Battle array. They are in position. They facing one another. But in between them is a valley. Me, me in the valley is going down. The Philistines stood up on one side. I want y'all to see that because I'm going to go there in a second. And the Israelites on another. This is us on one side and the enemy on the other side. This is the enemy. This is the attacker, the avenger, the killer, the destroyer, all on this side. Amen. And over here you got God's chosen people. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but we all know through the word that Jesus comes to give life. And not only does he give life, he gives it more abundantly. Amen. In between both armies, there is a valley. See, that's something about that valley. We all think about this here. We up on this mountain. Nothing is going down. They looking at me, and I'm looking at them. We up in this high place. I'm looking over there at what I'm facing. Now, here we go. On this side, the Philistine, uh, Israelites over there. The Israelites, okay, Israelites, Philistines, here we are facing what we're facing, looking at us, daring us to come after it, daring us to want to make up in our mind that we want to make a change, daring us that if we step out by faith, then things are going to change. Okay, over there what we have is fear looking at us, 
guilt looking at us, condemnation looking at us, oppression, depression, suppression, repression looking at us. What are we going to do, huh? Helplessness, hopelessness, powerlessness looking at us. What are we going to do about it, huh? Anger, bitterness, unforgiveness over there looking at us. It's looking at us, huh? Low self-esteem, lack of confidence, low self-image, low self-worth looking at us. What are we going to do? Daring us to step down in the valley to make the change. It's not enough. We facing what we're going through. We facing what we're dealing with. To face it is one thing. I'm facing this issue. I'm facing uh, my marriage falling apart. I'm facing my kids acting out. I'm facing my finances overtaking me. I'm facing all these challenges through life. Uh, I'm facing uh, want to be in position, want to be in power, want to have status. I'm facing greed. I'm facing gambling. All these things are facing me, but what am I willing to do about it? See, I know what I'm facing. I know what I'm dealing with. I know what I'm up against, but what am I willing to do about it? I know that this stuff in my, is in my way. I know that these things are keeping me from possessing their promised land, but what am I willing to do with it? We are over here standing back in fear, trembling, scared to make a move. We know we need to make the decision. We know it won't change, but we won't step out by faith. David could not be a king until he learned to be a shepherd. There are some things that we have to learn at the bottom in the process that we are going to need when God takes us to that place that he is destined for us. In this valley, in this low place, at this threshing floor. We all know the threshing floor. This is a place of separation. This is a place where the wheat is separated from the tear. This is a place where we separate realities from truth. This is a place where your faith becomes a witness and drowns out your fear. This is a place at the altar where we come to press the reset button in our life. God has to break us on the inside so we can go to that low place. And in that low place, we are humble. In that low place, we are willing to see that God is ready to make a change. But in that low place, see, when we was up here, we didn't need God. In that high place, I'm high, I'm good. I'm riding off the success. Everything is peaking. Everything is going my way. I'm flowing. I don't need God in that place. That's not what you're saying, but your word, your actions speak just like your words. But when you go down in that valley, when you go down into that low place, when you go down into that humbling place, when you go down into that place that you have to alter your life, when you go down into that place where you know what, whatever I don't confront won't change, as Pastor I always say. So when you get ready to confront something, you got to go into that low place and confess that I need help in this area. Jesus, take the wheel. Lord, I done messed this up, Lord. I've been going hard as I could. And, Lord, I done made so many mistakes, Lord. Lord, I done made so many failures. I stayed in my failures. I stayed in my brokenness. I stayed in my mistakes. You have to come into this low place. And if God is so God that he'll get down in the mistake with you. He'll get down in your failure with you. He'll get down in the brokenness with you. He'll get down in the mistakes with you. God is so good. And then when he heals you, he'll come out. You're dirty. You're, you're, you're going through sin. All this stuff that you're dealing with, all this stuff that's on your life everything that's in your way. God will get down in the broke down with you. He'll get down in the let down with you. God will get in that place. But you have to come to the valley. You have to come to the threshing floor. You have to come to the place of separation. You have to come to the place that your life will be altered in the valley. Me, me in the valley is going down. This is what our seat look like. Even though you're sitting down, you're standing up when you don't meet me in the valley. This picture of Jesus right here is beautiful. He wants us. He wants to locate us. Then when Jesus locates you and I, he wants us to confront what we are facing 
It is the sovereignty of God that wants to locate us. He already knows where you are. He said, Adam, where are you? Where are you today? But in that place of hiding, in that place of denial, God is seeking after you. Sometimes we go after God, but God comes after us. God came after Adam. God is coming after you. But when he gets there, he's saying, where are you? What are you doing? Why are you not doing what I left you to do? Why are you not walking in that place that I called you to walk? Why are you not doing what I chose you to do? Why are you not fulfilling what I set you apart to do? Why are you not walking in the fullness of your potential? Why do you not even understand what you are called to do? Why are you not tilling the land? Why is your heart so hard? Why is your heart so stiff? Why are you walking around in bitterness and unforgiveness? Where are you? When I put you here, I did not put you in unforgiveness or bitterness, yet you have allowed that bitterness and unforgiveness unforgiveness to seep into your life. Unforgiveness and bitterness is like mold. You know when mold form on the bread, it does not stay small. It begins to grow. It begins to stretch. It begins to increase. So if you do not deal with whatever you're dealing with, it will not go away. It will not walk away. You and I are going to have to deal with it. So where are you? What we are facing is not going away. It's not going to walk out. You are going to have to make up in your mind that you are going to have to fight to be delivered. You are going to have to fight for your freedom. You can wish it away. You can hope it away, but it's still going to be there. Until you come into that valley, until you come into that threshing floor, that place that will separate you from what you're dealing with. Amen. There is a cause. There is a cause. 1 Samuel 17, verse 89, it says, Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Goliath said to himself, not only do you have to fight, but you're going to have to kill me. I want us to look at Goliath from another aspect. I know um, they painted this picture of Goliath as a giant. They gave details of Goliath as a giant, but they didn't give details of our issues of what we're facing in that chapter. See, Goliath was sent, listen to this, to get in the way. Goliath was sent to keep you back. Goliath was sent to be a distraction, sent to manipulate you, sent to uh, uh, stop you from reaching your place of destiny, to get in the way of your assignment. Goliath is a problem. We got to deal with it. Even if he's a giant, it's a big problem. Amen. But he will not go down until you take it in the valley. Down goes Goliath. Down goes the circumstance. Down goes the situation. Down goes the challenge. Down goes what you're up against. Down goes what's standing in the way. It will not go away on its own. You are going to have to fight for it. There is a cause. If there was no Goliath, if, now look at this, if nothing gets in your way, if nothing keeps you back, if there is no resistance, no roadblock, no hindrance, then David couldn't have passed his test. That is put in the way so that you can pass the test. <laughs> Point two, equip for the fight. Things are going to get in the way. This is a test. Your faith takes you to higher levels in God, but your faith has to be tested. We always hear Pastor Lawrence say, Men's Atlanta say, faith is not faith until it is tested. Your faith 
has to be tested. Your faith has to go through trial and fire. Your faith has to pass through the waters. Your faith has to pass through some things. But God said, when I go through the waters, I will be with you. So instead of standing back, you got to step in. You got to stop holding back and you got to get in. But you do it by faith because God said that I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, when you, they will not drown you, even though it looked like you're going to get overtaken, even though you look like you're in over your head, you will not drown. Down goes Goliath. Some of us are stuck in a boxing ring. I'm not a boxer, but I'm going to move like one. You can't move and won't move. Remember, the Philistines were on their side. The Israelites were on this side of the mountain. These soldiers of war, trained men, were stuck. They couldn't see the victory over Goliath. Jesus said it is finished. You are equipped for the fight. This is a faith fight. Amen. Second Corinthians 5 and 7 says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Hebrews 1 11 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, yet the evidence of things not seen. So today, what are you hoping for? What is it that's pressed upon your heart? What do you really have a great desire for? What do you have a need for? God said, I am their present help in their time of need. And then he goes on to say about faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if you want to be pleasing in the eyes of God, you're going to need some faith. If you want God to move, you're going to need some faith. If you want God to step in, you and I are going to need some faith. If you want to see change, transformation, you and I are going to need some faith. So, faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. Now, this look like it's going to overtake me. This look like it's going to get the best of me. This look like I don't stand a chance. This look like I'm in over my head. This look like all hell has broken loose in my life. This look like no matter where I turn, I can't get a breakthrough. I can't even get a break. This what it says for me, though, to walk by faith, not by sight, even though this is what I see. Can I still step in this thing knowing that God is with me? Can I still step into this thing knowing that God is in control? Can I still step into this thing knowing that Jesus is at the wheel? Can I still step in knowing that I'm going to get the victory in spite of what it looked like? Can I still step in knowing that I'm going to be overcome by the blood of the Lamb? Can I still get the victory knowing that when I overcome by this blood that I will testify that I'm overcome? Jesus needs somebody take the witness stand, but it's going to take a faith walk because it's a faith fight. So you're going to have to step out by faith. The deck is stacked against you. But you got to let your hope rise. The Bible says those who hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. So even though this situation is struggle, I'm sitting low, but I got to rise. And then when I can't rise no more, he say, run, and you won't grow weary. I'm going to run as long as I can. And then he says, walk and not faint. After I have got up and tried to rise and couldn't rise no more, then I ran as hard as I can run. I'm going to walk this thing out. And then guess what? Now when I done walked it out, now he said, get out the way. Now I'm going to step in. See, that Paul wasn't in there. Woo! See, God can't do nothing when you and I are in the way. When you step out by faith, you're saying, God, you step in, in, I'm behind you. So when you step in, even though physically and naturally you see yourself, but before you is God. So when you step in, he already made that step. All he was ready to do for you to make up in your mind, as soon as you lift your leg, he stepped in. So stop letting fear keep you back. It's time to step in. Even though it don't look like it's going your way, you have to go in by faith. Knowing that God is ahead of you. 
knowing that God has prepared the way for you, knowing that God has made a way for you, knowing that God knows the expected end. But guess what? We do. Not all of us. Possibly some of us. Possibly the majority of us. Possibly a few of us. We won't make that step. Is there anything too hard for God? We hear that, but it's going to take faith to believe that. You were stuck in the ring back to the boxing match, but you have to let your faith take a swing at fear. You are going to have to leave the familiar and step into the unfamiliar. We learn that through discipleship training. We are empowered by that through our discipleship training. We are encouraged by that through our discipleship training. We embrace that through our discipleship training. That is etched in our minds through our discipleship training. This is the model of the house, huh? You got to lead the familiar through the great Dr. Miles Monroe and step into the unfamiliar. You got to leave what you know and step into the unknown. You got to leave what's comfortable and step into a new thing. But only when you make that step, you got to leave the shallow and step into the deep. Huh? The deep calls out to the deep. Uh, you're going to have to leave the mountaintop and go down in the valley. It's going down. You got to step out the boat into the water. Peter said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. Jesus said, it's me, come. Even that step and the Lord is right there. You heard that small, still voice and said, come. That small, still voice said, go. What's holding you back? Point three, there is a cause. When, remember when David went out on the battlefield? You got Goliath talking noise to all his brothers. And little old David, the little brother, come out there and say, what's happening? What's going on? Why are y'all letting him talk to y'all like that? If you knock him down, knock him out, what's the reward? This is what the little brother saying. And got seven big brothers before him. People will hold you to your past. All Eliab could say to David, Goliath been talking to us for 40 days in the valley calling out the whole entire army, and nobody was willing to step up. Nobody was willing to face that thing that was calling them out. Nobody was willing to face what was in their way. Nobody was willi willing to handle Goliath. Nobody. But David stepped in. Whose word are you going to believe, even though people hold you to your past? What they say or what God says about you and what God has shown you? What is standing between what they are saying and what God says is always something between you or what's between. People, I have heard people say, you are pro I'm a product of my environment. I used to say that it sounded good. I don't say that anymore. You are not a product of your environment. You are not a product of your past. You are not a product of your mistakes. You are not a product of your failures. You are not a product of how people dropped you. You are not a product of how people mishandled you. You are not a product of none of that. But what you are a product of is the great I am. You are a product of destiny. You are a product of purpose. You are a product of potential. You are a product of living a meaningful life. You are a product of what God says you are. You are a product of not what you're doing, but what you are becoming. You are a product of the promise. You are a product of what the word of God says about your life. You are a product of being fearfully and wonderfully made. You are a product of being the first and not the last. You are a product of being the first, the last is now first. You are a product of that now. No longer are you a product of your environment. Rebuke that in the name of Jesus. You're a product of today. You're a product of tomorrow. 
You're a product of the leadership you're up under. You're a product of the house that you serve in. You're a product of that, a positivity, a product of purpose. Amen? No longer am I a product of my environment. No longer am I a product of the past. A lot of people, though, around you, even a person sitting to your left, sitting to your right, that's sitting behind you or possibly in front of you, they don't know everything you had to survive. When people around you don't understand all the hell that you have been through and you still are standing. Everything that you had to overcome and you still are standing. Everything that you had to survive and you still are standing. You know that in 2 Timothy says that you are a chosen generation. That's why you can You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a peculiar people. And you should praise him who brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. But we always giving God a breakthrough praise. But God's looking for a special praise. Listen to this. He wants a been through praise. Can you give him a been through praise? What did it bring you through when you think back over your life? Huh? He's looking for a been through praise. It's got a special sound. It don't sound like no breakthrough praise. God is looking for a been through praise. It's got a special sound. You've been through some things. You've overcome some things. You've been through the fire. You walked through the water. You've overcome. It's a special sound. If you've been through, you can only give this type of praise. You can't give this type of praise if you have not been through anything. I've been through praise. Woo, Lord, I've been through praise. It's an overcoming praise. It's got a special sound in heaven. The blessing is in remembrance. Oh, can you remember? Your life don't look like what you've been through. Can you remember? I don't look like what I've overcome. Can you remember? Thank you. Whew. Have your way, Lord. Been through. Been through praise. They threw 66 years, but God stepped in. It's a been through praise. Let's sit down. Thank you, Lord. People around you don't understand how you got peace in your mind. David was made for this. Ah, you were made for the struggle. You were made for what you've been through. David went through his preparation, which put him in position for elevation, which brought him to destination. You were made for this, even though you went through some things, even though your obedience has brought you to this point. Ah, it's not about the elevation, it's about the destiny. Ah, God has a plan. God has a plan. This plan includes you. There is a cause. Oh, you must go up against your Goliaths. You must go up against what's in your way. You must go up against what's standing tall. You must go up against what's look impossible to overcome. You must go up against what does not want to see you succeed. You must go up against what's assassinating your name, your character. You must go up against of what's getting in the way of your identity. You must go up against uh, what's getting in the way of God calling you what you're going to become because it's not going to move. Whatever you're facing that will, has created a roadblock of resistance and hindrance in your life, it challenges these of giants of your today and your tomorrow. These are giants between your past, what's behind you, and your present, your right now. And in between is you. You the in between. That's the difference maker. Jesus understood the cause. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. 
Jesus was on assignment from the day he was created by God. Uh, he was the only one that could save mankind. Could you imagine if Jesus stepped out of the spirit for one hair of a second? It would be no more grace, uh, nor would it be any more mercy. Uh, we have the nerve to give up on things. I know some of us have wanted to throw the towel in. Some of us have wanted to wave the white flag because I've been there. But I didn't wave that flag, nor did I throw the towel in. I stayed in the fight. Uh, there will not be any mercy or grace. We will be finished if Jesus did this. But are you the one? David went into the valley. Uh, he wanted to know what was going on. God looking for that one that will step up and be the kingsman redeemer in his family. Ah, uh, God looking for that one that is willing to go into a place, oh God, that no man can go but one who has been through a fire, that no man will go, that one who's been tried and tested and found to be true. God is looking for that one, or you the one. David was the one. Jesus was the one who stepped up on the cross, ah, and he died and he buried. But guess what? It did not end there. He rose again. Amen. He rose on the third day with all power in his hands. If you have fallen, it does not end there. If you have stumbled, it does not end there. If you have made a mistake, it does not end there. If you have made excuses, it does not end there. If you have backslid in your life, it does not end there. If you have allowed that bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart to rise up, it does not end there. If you have not broke free from your past, it does not end there. If you have not broke free from any stronghold in your life, it does not end there. There is recovery. Amen. There is restoration. Amen. There is redemption. Amen. There is freedom in the Lord. God came. He says, he who sets free by the son is free indeed. So God wants to set your mistakes free, set your past free, uh, set every failure, every mistake, hurt, pain, anything anybody did for you, only God will deliver you. There is a cause. As I begin to bring this to a close, our job as believers Every believer is called to one ministry, and I learned this through my MIT. We are all called, are y'all listening, to the ministry. If anybody want to know what ministry you're called to, to the ministry of reconciliation. We are all called to lead the people back to God. We are all called to that ministry. There is a cause. All of us have an assignment. But along the way, there will be trials and tribulations. There is a cause. You will be and you have been battlefield tested. There is a cause. We must come out to bring someone else out. And as we always hear pastors say, it takes one to reach one. There is a cause that God has given us dominion to take back everything that the enemy has taken and stole from you. There is a cause, there is a reason why Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is a cause we have not been left alone. We have a helper, we have a comforter, a paracletus, and it is called the Holy Ghost. Ah, the Apostle Paul said he gave us instruction that when we are in warfare to put on our armor of God. There is a cause for your life. If you know there is a cause for your life, won't you give God some glory?